Thank you for the lovely flowers. Wow. Welcome to the Breakwater Mega Embassy Church. We are an embassy because we're ambassadors for Christ, and we're here to have a business meeting. We want to do business with God today. What do you say? All right. And we're mega because we love Jesus a whole lot. I will praise you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. You have not let my foes rejoice over me. Come on. Sing praises to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. All in favor? Let's just begin to praise him right now, shall we? Father, we do come before you right now, and we say that you are amazing, creator of all things, that you became flesh and dwelt among us to suffer on the cross and be raised from the dead to bring us back into presence, into your presence and into union with you. We thank you, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you've drawn us together today. We pray, Lord, that you'd open up the windows of heaven, that we, as we worship you, Lord, that you would put a shield about us, Lord, a protection over us, that we'd be able to serve you in our generation. We pray, Lord, that you'd open up the windows of heaven today, that we would hear from you today, be strengthened by you today, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, let's do just that. Let's sing praise to the Lord, all you saints. Stand if you can. Yeah. Excited to be here today. Before the throne of God above, have a strong, perfect plea, great high priest whose name is love, ever lives and pleads for me. We're going to do that over here. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart, no tongue can bid me thence depart. With Satan tempts to lead to despair tells me of the guilt within upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because a sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon The great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior.
Go ahead and set, set a nice temple for that, dude.
atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here
can happen now for the spirit of the lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the lord is here a miracle can happen now the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here, is here. The spirit of the Lord is here. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Put a hand on the person next to you. Find someone to pray for a miracle for them. Yes. As the water is moving, we just want to believe God right now for great things. Lord, we come before you right now as we've worshipped you. we established your presence among us, your throne among us. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are Alpha and Omega. Lord, we see you healing, touching, blessing, moving restoring. We pray now, Lord, for this <clears throat> mighty congregation, Lord, this people that you brought together, that you be powerful here today, Lord, among us, that your name would be high and lifted up. We've declared your name here in this place to be high above every name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just love you for your power to restore us and to heal us and to make us new. We pray for your motivation, Lord, to serve you in our generation. Even as we come before you today, Lord, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit for the comfort that you give us. We thank you that you have more for us to do, Lord, that you have more for us to accomplish in your name. We pray, Lord, that we'd be faithful to walk through those open doors that you've provided for us. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to make you, make you known in our generation. We bless you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here today in this little church building that you have given us the oversight. We're just so grateful uh, for so many things today in Jesus' name. What do you say? Amen. Is God amazing? Amen. <sighs> Greet those around you. Spread a little love of Jesus. Thank you, awesome worship. Woo! Welcome everyone who's viewing us from the outside world. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Glad that you're joining with us.
All right, everybody. God bless you. In the name of Jesus, the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, we have a special opportunity today to hear from one of our favorite guest speakers of all time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That set the bar high today. <laughs> set the bar high. Usually, I would be out fishing this weekend with my brother's animal uh, annual fishing trip up at Bass Lake. And with this 15th atmospheric storm, <laughs> uh, the lakes are filled up. Thank God. We're so glad for all the water we have. I'd love to actually go see Lake Mead filled up. That'll be great. <clears throat> all of our reservoirs, the spillways are working. God's really been blessing us almost too much with this, with this rain. We've got some more coming in. So... Lakes are filled with debris, and it's hard to fish, and I go to catch fish, not to just get away. So I'll do it next month. We'll put it off. What do you say? So I had scheduled for Bobby Key to come, and so we got him here today. And uh, so that's special for us. And so we're going to hear from him right now. All in favor? All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Kurt. How are we doing this morning? Awesome. Well, the good news is, is when you get Bobby Key, you get the family. So my wife, Becky, is here this morning, and uh, my two kids, Bella and Selah, uh, they're also here. And uh, life, is, uh, life is going well for us. It's been a little while since I've been with all of you. Some of you I don't even know that well, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Bobby Key. Uh, I've been married for 14 years. I have two little girls, six years old, eight years old. We homeschool them. When I say we, I'm working and my wife is at home homeschooling them. Uh, the kids are getting smart. They're smarter than I am at history and all kinds of things. That homeschool program's working out really well for them. Um, my background is, is uh, back in the day I was a youth outreach pastor and then a church planter and then did some other things. And a few years ago, God put it in my wife and I's heart to leave Northern California, move back to LA where we're from, and to be open to planting a new church in Torrance. And so we came down here, uh, needed to find how, how God was gonna take care of our family. And so when I first spoke here, I was doing heating and air conditioning out of Orange County. That led in towards me getting uh, hired by uh, LA City as a building inspector. So now Monday through Friday, I stop on about 15 different construction sites a day and make sure people are building buildings that aren't going to fall on people's heads. So it's, a, it's an important job, um, but uh, my heart, my family's heart will always be to see people come to know Jesus and grow in Christ. That's our, our burning passion, and it's carrying over into our children as well. My, uh, my youngest daughter, Sayla, she's six. I was picking her up from uh, Sunday school class at, uh, at church the other day, and, and her Sunday school teacher said, hey, can I talk with you for a minute? I said, sure. He said, hey, um, you might want to talk with your daughter because we do prayer requests in our Sunday school, and she always has a prayer request, and she's always praying that people would get saved and not go to hell. Like she has a different person she's praying for each time. And, uh, and he says, yeah, you might want to talk to her about like hell. And I said, well, does she seem herself afraid of hell? Is she worried about going to hell? Does it seem like a spirit of fear? He's like, no. I'm like, I think she's got it better than most of us then. She just wants to see people get saved. You know, she, uh, she picked that up from us. We're always wanting to see people get saved. Praise God. One of our family members who uh, uh, grew up in a family not knowing the Lord just gave his life to Christ about two weeks ago. And so we're seeing God do some really good things. When we moved to Torrance, we really didn't know uh, uh, too many people. I have like one family member that lives there, but didn't have any friends. And that's a hard situation to be in when you want to plant a church. How are you going to plant a church? You don't know anybody, right? But what's pretty neat is uh, when I'm out working and my wife is homeschooling, she'll take the kids to a park and inevitably she'll, inevitably she'll meet another mother and they'll start talking and faith will come up. And we find people pretty frequently who have an openness towards God, but have been turned off by religion at some point in their life. And so they're not growing in their knowledge of the Lord and the knowledge of his word. They're not connected to a Christian body. 
And so inevitably, my, my, inevitably, I can't say that word today. Can you say inevitably? inevitably? Is it just me or is that kind of tricky? I don't know. Yeah, it's a tricky word. Anyway, inevitably. That one sounded pretty good. Uh, we invite them to come over to our home. We tell them about the Lord. And, and now we have a Bible study that meets on Thursday nights where we have uh, about 10 families uh, that come. And it got too too big for our little apartment, so we had to find another place to host it. Uh, and have, there's oftentimes 15 or more adults and other 15 or more children. And so we're just seeing God do something. We, we don't quite see it as a church plant yet. You know, a number of those people don't even know Jesus yet, but they love being prayed for. They love learning about the Lord. And, uh, and we're seeing them get closer and closer to that point of saying, Jesus, take my life. You know, I want to serve you forever. And so we, uh, we anticipate that that will become a new Foursquare church in Torrance in the near future. You might ask yourself, like, does Torrance or does the South Bay really need another church? You know, there seems like they're all over the place. And, and you know what the truth of the matter is? It's probably not. And the real truth of the matter, too, is there's really only one church if Jesus is the head of it all, right? But I think that the, this area could use another outreach center, another disciple-making center, and a congregation whose unique focus is at reaching the lost, those who feel far from God and helping them to know that God loves them and has a plan for their life. Does that make sense? So that's what we want to see happen. Well, today it's great to be with all of you. I hadn't been here maybe for uh, about a year. Uh, I filled in last year at a, a church in Long Beach. Their senior pastor's spouse had passed away, and um, they needed to have a bereavement leave to find healing and to, you know, to weep and to recover and to just experience the peace of God wash over them in that time of, of difficulty. And so I filled in as the interim pastor in Long Beach for a while. And so anyway, our lives are very full, but it's so good to be with you guys today and have the privilege of teaching the word in the same fellowship where Pastor Kurt is the lead pastor. How many of you guys love your pastor? Can we give it up for Pastor Kurt and Irma? We were at a meeting like me a month ago, a pastor's meeting, and he was telling me about uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, sermon series that you guys are talking about. It sounded so good. I wanted to listen to it as I was driving from uh, inspection job site to, to another job site and just thinking it's amazing what God has done and continues to do and even greater things will do through his people and through this church. Uh, to think about the young women's lives in Malawi who will never be the same because they've had a chance to get an education because they're not spending all day walking miles and miles carrying water back to their village and and the wellness that's happening there because they don't have to get sick as often because they have clean water and the new churches that have been started and you guys know all these things but now the Bible's going into the school it's remarkable and so again just I'm really inspired by all of you and I hope in some way um, you'll be a little inspired by my heart for the Lord too, and together we'll leave here uh, when I'm done talking, very encouraged to be a light in the world. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. Uh, today I want to talk to you about a phrase that Jesus said that all of you have heard before, I'm pretty sure, and all of you are probably doing a good job of living out what Jesus said you would be and that would be salt and light. Can you say salt and light? Salt and light. Yeah. So I don't have a great sermon title for this message, but uh, we could call it lightly salted. <laughs> it's got the two words together, okay? But I hope you're heavily salted. But nevertheless, let's call it lightly salted because it's got light and salt mixed in that title. Let me start off with a story. So when we were living in Northern California and and uh, really involved with our church as the lead pastor. Becky was the worship leader. Uh, oftentimes when our ministry time had come to a conclusion and everybody left, we would wait till we had a chance to talk with everybody and pray with everybody. And then it was our turn to get our family out of there and lock up the facility and, and turn out the lights. And my favorite place to park my car was, you know, on, like by a side door and the light switch in our sanctuary was somewhere in the back. 
and we had our, our lights on a dimming switch. And so if you hit off, you had about 10 seconds to get to the door. And this was a sanctuary that could seat, you know, 350 people. There was a lot of chairs down. And so it was almost like a game for me that I would be in the back and I would hit the light switch and I knew I had a good 10 paces before it went totally dark. And then you just imagine navigating through this room completely pitch black and just trying to get to the door safely. And uh, sometimes I did it, but most of the time I ran into a chair or I would run into a pillar that was holding up the roof or something. And so I, the first 10 steps when the light was fading would be very purposeful, would be, be quick. I'd be, you know, big, long strides. And then the lights would go completely out. And I would just take a moment to try to remember where everything was laid out. And then I would start moving with my hands out. And, and at first it'd be kind of quick because I knew where everything was. And then I'd kind of forget and I'd go slower and slower and slower until I kicked something. And anyway, eventually I'd get out, get out the door. The point of the matter is that it's much easier to move, to not be in fear uh, when there's light, when you're walking in the light. Right. Isn't that true? Amen. Light is good. But when we're walking in darkness, it's almost impossible to be productive or to be fruitful or to have no fear. But in the light, you can have the light that you are supposed to have. Now, if we transition that same idea that we understand physically, spiritually, I, I bet every single person in this room has stories, experiences of how you are trying to navigate through your life while walking in the darkness, spiritually. Maybe you hadn't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you hadn't acknowledged that his word is truth. That's the accurate description of how things are in our world spiritually. And, and you were just walking into hurtful relationship and wrong prior, prioritization of key things in your life and just kind of making messes and trying not to, to hurt yourself too bad or other people. Can anybody relate to walking in darkness at any point of their life? And then we come to this point, like our family member just recently did, where you, you get to this point where you're like, okay, I give up. God, take over. And then the most amazing thing happens. A miracle happens. Even if nobody knows it other than you and your soul, light comes into you. The goodness of God, the grace, the mercy that washes away sin, and you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, you might still have the same scars or the same tattoos or the same haircut, but you have become something completely different. Not just a new version of the old you, but something new because the Spirit of God has now come to dwell inside of you. Now, there are still many people all around us. I would say in your world. When I say your world, I'm talking about maybe a unique uh, 8 to 12 people that are part of your world. They could be your neighbors, they could be your sons or daughters, they could be even a spouse, they could be coworkers, people that you know that I don't, and I might not ever have the privilege. There are still people stumbling around in the darkness in your world, and Jesus says, you are the light. You be the salt. So we want to talk about that and explore some of what that means this morning. If you brought your Bibles, would you open to Matthew chapter 5 and look for verse 13? In a little while, I'm going to start reading. I brought the New Living Translation this morning. So if you're reading out of the New King James or the NIV, it might sound a little different, but it's not going to be uh, different in any theological way. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Let me give you a little context on what we're about to read, since it's kind of awkward just to jump somewhere towards the end of a book, right? So what's happening in the scriptures? What is Matthew? Well, again, I know many of you have known the Lord for a long time, and so this might be a little bit of review or for somebody else in the room, but the Bible is not like a normal book that you would go and pick up from the bookstore, it's the Word of God. And not only is it different in that way, but it's actually a library of books in one binding. Is that right? And so we have an Old Testament with many books, and we have a New Testament in many books. And the beginning of the New Testament uh, is called Matthew, or more 
uh, properly titled would be the gospel, meaning good news, according to Matthew. And it's not the only gospel. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Matthew would be considered a synoptic gospels in that it has similar material and stories as would be found in Mark and Luke. And then John has this poetic, philosophical, um, very accurate take on Jesus, but it wouldn't be considered part of the synoptics. So today we're in Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. It's a gospel because it's all about Jesus. One, some of the unique features of Matthew is that it was written primarily to a Jewish audience who very much needed to know that if they're going to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior is that he is the fulfillment of everything God had promised them in the Old Testament. And so you're going to find more Old Testament quotations in Matthew than any of the other Gospels. Um, not only that, but the Holy Spirit moved on Matthew to write down and record more of Jesus' teachings than in any of the other, other Gospels. And in Matthew chapter 5, we jump into what I consider to be the greatest sermon of all time, and we call it the Sermon on the Mount. We call it that because it was preached on a mount, you know, and it was a sermon that was preached to disciples. That's important for us to understand. Well, Jesus had so many things to say to the entire world that everybody should hear. This is a message for those of us who have said yes to Jesus, and now we are followers of Jesus. Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't yet come to that point, that doesn't mean it's not for you. Um, but there's something you can learn here, but this is something for disciples, learners of Christ, followers of Christ, and what we're supposed to be. Now, I said it's, uh, to me, the greatest sermon of all time, and that's because it's Jesus' words, and in the subject matter that he covers is huge. In this one message, he talks about prayer, priorities, anger, adultery, divorce, promise-making and promise-keeping, keep wealth, anxiety, hell, heaven, and what it means to be a true disciple. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of poser disciples all over the place, but he wants you to know what's the truth. There's things that are in this passage of Scripture that are many people's most known portion of the Bible. There's the Lord's Prayer. There's the Golden Rule. There's the, the passage about turning the other cheek and loving your enemies. That's all in this section. And right after that portion where Jesus gives the Beatitudes, the blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, the blessed are those who mourn. After that section, Jesus rolls into the passage that I want to share with you today, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. It says this, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? You can go ahead and answer. Can you make salty again? No, there's not a way to do it. It will be thrown, uh, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. You're like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go ahead and thank him for it. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you that you entered this world. You, you took on flesh. We call that the incarnation. But you never gave up being divine, fully God and fully man, to show us the right way, to correct misconceptions and misunderstandings about righteousness and your word that people were living in to show us a better way, a new way to be human, a new way to live in community, to save our souls, to be our rescuer. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done, for all that you are. Thank you that you died on the cross for our sins as a substitute, God, for the death penalty that we brought on ourselves in our sin and rebellion. But thank you, God, that while you paid the price, you rose again from the grave and you poured out your spirit on the church. 
and you faithfully intercede and cover us and that you have gone to heaven to prepare a place for us and one day you will return for your church to be with you for all time, forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have a chance to gather together today to praise your holy name, to study your word, to be encouraged. And I pray today that you would help us to understand what you meant when you called us salt and light so many years ago. And may that be true of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we talk about Matthew chapter 5, we get the context. We call it Matthew, even though it's all about Jesus, because the author's name was Matthew. But really, this passage resonates profoundly with all of us because it's Jesus' words, Jesus' message, Jesus' prophecy, prediction about the church. It comes from the heart of Jesus. Jesus. One preacher once said, it's in Jesus' name that desperate people pray and grateful people worship and angry people swear. When Jesus spoke, people marveled and the dead were raised and demons fled and waves were stifled. The preacher is none other than Jesus who says that we're salt and light. The very same person that years later, a church planter, an apostle by the name of Paul would write, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. It's Jesus who never married, who never himself sat down and wrote a book, who never held a political office, who never led an army. And yet today, over 3 billion people on this planet believe him to be divine and worship him as Lord and Savior. When we study this passage, we learn from Jesus, the only begotten Son of God who reigns supreme over all. Does he not? He does. It's no wonder why after Jesus taught this, Matthew recorded the, the way that people received the message, and they said that, that it made them, it brought them to a place of amazement. The crowds were amazed at his teaching, it says in Matthew chapter 7, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law of his day. You are salt and light, salt and light. We're going to get into some of the ways that the first hearers of this message would have processed that and understood that. But first, let's just not overlook the most basic overview of what Jesus is saying when he calls us salt and light. What he's saying is that his disciples would be quite unlike the corrupt systems and ways of the people of the world. His disciples would be a positive influence in the world. Just as light is and salt is that you and I are and will be. Now, I must say this. Um, you probably would have figured it out on your own, but let me just give a couple confessions this morning. First of all, I'm not that great at this. No one seems shocked in the room. I, I am not always the best light or the most salty person around. There's a reason why I don't have a Jesus or Sign of the Fish bumper sticker on the back of my car. Because people would be like, you know, they would not be turned on to Jesus if they saw the way I navigate the 405. Let me just say that. So Jesus is working on me, right? And sometimes I miss out on beautiful opportunities to share hope with people about Jesus. I try to seize them. I pray in the morning, Lord, help me be open to them, but sometimes I miss them. Can anybody else relate to them? I'll tell you one story. A while back, I go into this coffee shop, and this barista has this cool tattoo on his arm. It, it looked like an artistic N, like a big thing, and it had like some other symbols on it. I didn't know what it was. I was assuming 
that this was maybe some kind of band that he is in or something like that, in which case, hey, I'm totally down to talk about music and bands. It seemed interesting. And if he's displaying it, obviously he's not ashamed to talk about it is the way I thought about it. So I was like, what is that on your arm? Tell me about that to this barista as he's serving me up my coffee. And he tells me it is the symbol of nihilism. Now, I wasn't familiar with what nihilism was. So I asked him, I said, well, what's nihilism? And he says, it's the rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. Yeah. I just, I wasn't expecting it. I just wasn't expecting it. You know, I just, and you would think, that someone who's filled with the Spirit of God, someone who's written like 900 sermons and has been doing so since he was 20 years old, someone who loves to tell people about Jesus would be able just to take that moment like some kind of spiritual judo and use the weight there just to like, like, boom, you need Jesus. But I didn't. He put his coffee down at the same time and I just go, all right, well, good luck with your nihilism. That was it. And I walked out. So it's ironic that the Lord wants me to be the one bringing this message today because I don't seize every opportunity that's in front of me. And you know what I think? Nobody does. I mean, wow, what an amazing world it would be in if you were always prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. If you were always ready to turn an odd comment into a, an opportunity to Amen. real talk, talk about your best friend to change your life. I mean, pray for people and just every moment. I can't do anything about that coffee shop that was up in Northern California. Maybe I'll stop by sometime and see if the guy's still stuck in nihilism. But, but I can do something about today and this afternoon and tomorrow and just receive God's help in being salt and light because the world needs it, right? Yeah. We have great opportunity today. I mean, we live in the same community as you guys live in. And I mean, every couple weeks, no, no, that's too quick. But I mean, every like couple months, we find a new family who's like looking to start growing in the Lord, doesn't have a home church. It, it's, there's a hunger that's happening. Um, but it's not without its challenges. You know? That, that, that might be why we're praying for revival. We're anticipating revival, but it hasn't broken out yet. Some of the challenges that I wrote down, you could come up with your own list, I'm sure, but I'll just give you a, a quick list of some of the things that I'm seeing is happening. I see the young pulled into agnosticism. Just this declaration, this, this giving up of, I don't think I'll ever really know who God is. Because this friend believes in this religion, and this friend believes in this religion, and this friend believes in this religion, and this friend believes in no religion. And my science teacher at school taught me this, told me this one thing, and I live in California, I live in Los Angeles area, and I just know that the greatest sin we could have is to be judgmental about other people's beliefs, and so I don't really know how I'm going to ever figure it out, and I don't really think I want to try, I just want to live my life and have fun, and so I'm agnostic. I'm just going to tell you that I am fine with you believing something as long as it makes you a good person, but I am giving up on the search for truth. And, and that's where a lot of our young people find themselves today. There's others. Part of the challenge of the church not being as bright of a light, not this particular church, just in general, all churches, one of the challenges that we have is that people... I would even say mature disciples, people that love the Lord, people that know how to pray, people with great faith in God, knowledge of his word, are frustrated. They're frustrated that for years they've been doing everything that they know how to do to tell their 
you know, nephew or to tell their spouse or to tell their neighbor about Jesus. They've, they've gotten flyers from the church to invite them to the Easter outreach. They've, they've walked around. They've prayer walked. They've done these things. They've been doing it for years, and the fruit has just been kind of a long time coming. And what's happening is there seems to be even almost a greater hostility now towards just people talking about the Lord. And so people are like, fine. I'll keep it to myself unless you invite me. And so I just find that in general, church people are real frustrated about how in the world they're supposed to be light today. And so they withdraw and churches become these holy huddles. I just get together with my holy pals and it's like the church can go to hell, but we're getting ready to go to heaven. And it's just a weird dynamic. Another issue we have today is that people think now that you can be the light of the world without the light of the world. You know, if I just think pretty enough thoughts, if I just go to enough self-help seminars or read this book or set my goals and learn how to really make better goals and follow through with things that I can be everything that I'm supposed to be, but I don't need Jesus for it. How many of you guys know that doesn't work? We probably tried that before and it didn't work. That's why we know that this is the way. But these are all challenges that we find today. And yet Jesus, Jesus didn't say that salt and light wouldn't be without his challenges. But he said, you are the light. You are the salt. Let's talk a little bit about what salt would have been like at the time that Jesus spoke, gave this, this talk, how would they have thought about salt? One thing that's different about salt then versus salt now is that it used to be way more valuable. You guys are aware of that? Yeah. Like, for example, sometimes Roman soldiers could receive their wages in salt, in a measure of salt. You could trade it for things that you would need, almost like currency, if you were stationed someplace far away from uh, where, they had, where they took Roman coins or something. You get paid in salt. And that, that's even where our phrase today, when you have an employee who's not doing much, you say they're not worth their salt. It comes from that. So when Jesus says, you're the salt, there'd be people thinking, really? We're valuable to God? I mean, I blow opportunities to share Jesus with people in nihilism. I, you know, I, there's so much for me to learn in my theology. There's so many things that I can't do yet. There's so many ways that I need to grow still. And yet I'm valuable to the Lord in his plan for the world. That would, that'd be a bit of a game changer for a number of people. Salt then as salt now also, of course, um, would be a flavoring agent. How many of you guys like salt in your food? Yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. We got a hand raise in the back. All right, salt. Yeah, salt brings flavor. Um, it enhances the, uh, the flavors that are already there. I, I think Jesus was saying that the, the, the work of his church, the, the gifting of his people, the love that they express is going to bring out the beauty and the flavor of grace and joy that this world has been lacking. Salt. Salt, of course, at this time was a preservative. Not everybody had a little refrigerator in their home to keep their meat, but if you packed it in salt, it would last. There would be somebody who would be hearing Jesus say salt and think a preservative. Like, are you saying that it's our unique role to preserve genuine faith, to be able to, to transfer the knowledge of who Jesus is to the next generation, to take it into new communities and new relationships, that, that the truth of Jesus would last and not die out? Yes. So salt's a big deal. Turn to someone next to you, if you would, and just say, hey, stay salty. Come on. Salty. Yeah. <laughs> the original salty crew. Yeah, stay salty. But he didn't just say that we're to be salt, but he also said that we're to be light. That we're to be light. Light has a bunch of uh, amazing qualities. As I talked about in my opening story about having the lights makes it easier to navigate the room, what light does is light exposes, doesn't it? 
Yeah. That there's something about believers and they're, they're anchoring into the word of God, they're, the way that God is filling them with truth and, and his uh, aware, awareness of, of how things really are that allows us to, to point out what are really the, the issues that are happening in our world and, and what really joy is. Light exposes. Light disinfects. I mean, you could go on to Amazon.com and you can buy a little device that shoots UV rays onto your phone and kills things, apparently. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I saw it there. They're like 30 bucks, not a bad idea. But anyway, light disinfects, and maybe there's a way that the way Christians pray and worship <laughs> and serve um, pushes back the corrosiveness of evil in our world. And light fosters life, doesn't it? My, my little girls, uh, they love gardening, but we live in a little apartment. And so what we've been experimenting with over the last couple years What's this guy talking? What's this guy talking about? Cut that microphone. Um, we have a garden wall we're trying to grow in our apartment, and you know what? In the in certain seasons, we can grow herbs right in our dining room of our apartment because it gets enough light that comes in through the window, and we can grow things inside of our place. But at other seasons, the light just can't get there. And all we can really grow are succulents, you know, in there. And so we're figuring that out. But light fosters life. Life, or uh, light fosters life. And so all these are things that are true about light and true about God's people. A couple other interesting things about salt and light. That one better? Thank you. My goal is to use every microphone in the building before this <laughs> message is over. It's all good. Salt is interesting because it works internally. If I have guacamole and I set salt around the guacamole, it doesn't make the guacamole taste any better. Salt goes into the guacamole and makes it delicious. It's been tried in past attempts of Christian living to set up these like heaven on earth utopian societies away from the corruption of the world. But that wasn't what Jesus had in mind. He had in mind that we would be living rubbing shoulders, working with and around people who are far from him and that we would be salt, that we would be light, that we would change the flavor of the South Bay while being a part of it. But the interesting thing about light is it's kind of the opposite. Light never becomes part of the darkness. Well, salt works internally. Um, light works externally in the sense that, like I said, light never becomes part of the darkness. Light expels the darkness. And there's another truth there about Christian living. While we are in the world, we are never to be of the world. We got to figure out how the Lord wants us to reach out without selling out. And there's people that cross that boundary all the time. And with the Lord's help, we won't. In both cases, one of the big things on Jesus' heart as he's sharing this talk, your salt, your light, is he's wanting people to remain salty, to remain light. He's wanting them to stay the course. This comes across in this section when he's saying, um, you know, don't hide that lamp. No one does that. So you don't do that with your faith. Don't hide the transformation that God's doing in you. Don't hide the gospel from your words, from your conversation. 
Same thing with, with the salt. He's like, can, it's not valuable if it's losing its saltiness. Uh, Jesus, I don't think he's getting into, he does later on in, in other passages do about whether or not someone who is a Christian can become a non-Christian. That's a big theological talk that you've probably all had training on already. Jesus isn't really getting into that in this passage. What Jesus is really just saying, in my opinion, is he's saying, don't get off course. Whatever life throws at you, whatever hardship, whatever faith challenges, whatever hurdles, whatever storms, right? Whatever cyclones hit Malawi, like don't stop sending Bibles. Whatever the length is between the time you start praying and the miracle comes, don't stop believing that he can do miracles. Stay the course. And in all of our Christian life, there will become times when we're tempted to lose something, to give up on being salty. There'll be times when we are tempted to remain silent when we need to speak out. There are times when we will be tempted to withdraw when we need to engage. There will be times when we are tempted to ignore the issues rather than to going into spiritual warfare and praying over those issues consistently. There are times when we don't want to be active. We don't want to serve. We don't want to give. We don't want to tithe. We just want to live like the rest of the world. And the Lord saying, Stay salty. Stay the course. You're not like the rest of the world. You're inherently different. You're salt and you're light. I want to conclude by, um, don't get too excited. I'm not concluding immediately. I'm going to conclude <laughs> by giving just three ideas. Already, I, I probably could conclude because the Holy Spirit's probably already just putting things, highlighting things inside of you that, that he wants to do for that light within you to shine all the more. But let me just give you three ideas. First of all, um, just be you as you're being the light. With Jesus in you, but just be you. I, I think some people, when you hear a message like this, you just think, I need to be more like, and you think of this other person, I need to act more like that other person. God made you uniquely you for a reason. He could have made us all clones with the same interests, hobbies, talents, whatever, but he made us unique and there's a reason. So be you for Jesus and uh, do that though in growing to your full level, level of maturity. So the world doesn't need you to be a fake anything, just to be a real you. But what Jesus is calling you is to be the truest, deepest, most whole, pure version of you that you've ever been. And he wants to help you. The scriptures say, do not be conformed to this world. This world wants to cram you into a mold and say, that's what success looks like. That's what happiness looks like. Follow his word, not the mold this world would give. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 139, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm not complicated, I'm just wonderfully complex. God made me this way. <laughs> it's a lot of wording. Yeah. We're all complex. Be yourself, changed by the grace of God. The next thing that I would just say is um, be real on the inside. Be real on the inside. Being around church folk for a long time in my life, what I find is that maybe well-intentioned, well we think that if we're going to be light, we have to be dishonest, maybe in ourselves, of when we're struggling or when we're sad. And so you have almost like these plastic expressions on people's faces. It's like, how are you doing? And like, things aren't well. I'm like, I'm doing great. Praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> you got to be real on the inside. Can I tell you the truth? Is In the church that we were leading up in Sacramento, one of the guys who had the most profound impact at seeing people come to know Jesus and seeing new families come to our church was a guy who struggled every single day staying sober, every single day. And he wasn't doing a perfect job of it. 
But one thing that he had figured out real well, real well, is that he needed Jesus so much. And he could see right through other people and just be able to tell them, like, you know what you really need is Jesus. And that guy would see so many people coming to know the Lord and coming to our church. There's a lot of things that God wants to do in that man's life to transform him. But one thing that he's figured out is that he can be a light when he's real on the inside. He doesn't have to fake it. We're living in a society where there's a lot of people faking it, but they're looking for the genuine article, and we can be that for Jesus. Finally, number three is uh, live like you mean it. Live like you mean it. The Apostle Paul wrote in the first chapter to his uh, letter to the Romans saying, I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. There's something deeply profound about people who live like they mean it unashamed. Listen, we believe in a living God. We believe that we're going to have eternity with the Lord. We believe in a real heaven and a real hell. And we believe that Jesus has paid the price for our sins, that in essence, he's done the achieving. We just need to do the believing. Live like you mean it. Are you there? All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, it's a joy to be here and to be thinking of your word and talking about salt and light. And I know that there are many in this room who live that out every day. I hope that this message encourages them, Lord, that even now that you'd be strengthening, strengthening them spiritually so that they're not just loving or serving or giving out of their own strength, but there's flowing out of the fullness of your Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe there's others uh, who are in here, Lord Jesus, who someone particularly comes to mind, someone that they love, someone that they care about, who needs to come to know, Lord, that you are the light of the world, that you are the Son of God. Lord, I pray that you would show them how to pray, and how to live in such a way um, to uh, share their faith with those people and that we would all see the harvest come in, that we would see people come to know Jesus. Lord, we pray for... Breakwater Church to be full over and over again, Lord. We pray for outreach. We pray for people getting saved even outside of Sunday, out on the streets, in the homes, in all kinds of places. God, fill us with your spirit and do a unique thing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.
speak what is true.
the light of the world and Lord let us be an obvious light to other people God let us not be hidden like a bowl Lord but let us stand um, and shine before people and unbelievers and let us Lord too, not be frustrated Lord or feel like we're not producing fruit Lord but let us be thankful always in you and let us just always be conscious that we are a light of the world that, sh that shines on um, on others Lord in Jesus name amen, amen. All right. Thank you, Bob. Bobby. <sighs> you know, what I like is the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, right? 419, the very next chapter, he says, you are light. Whatever we are, whatever our failures are, our weaknesses are, our regrets are, or whoever we are, you are light. I will make you fishers. That there's a process in development and growth, but right now, what you know, where you are, what you do, you are the light in that place. So is there a need for another church? Absolutely. You're reaching people that people aren't reaching. You're, you're meeting a need in a place where only you can reach. So we're grateful for that and grateful for you and what you're doing to, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to continue to pray for you. And then the, the, the light thing, of course, the path of the righteous shines what? Brighter and brighter. We have hope for the future because we're following the pathway of God. We don't care what the world does. We don't care what's going on out there. The path of the righteous will shine brighter and brighter until full day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't know over what they stumble. Jesus says we walk in the light. We know what's ahead of us. We have a great future. We believe in what God's going to do with us. Amen? So we got a couple of announcements to make concerning our projects in Africa. And most of you are aware that this cyclone has hit the country over there. But I want to get to this, this cool little kid right here first. This is Justin Jenkins. I told you last week that <clears throat> there's this... Uh, high school, uh, Norwalk High School, and they do something called giving charity to charities. So their whole senior class gets together and decides on different charities they want to support. So Justin found Water Wells for Africa, and I was invited out there to participate in this and give a small presentation. So you can see the entire student body here, right? So I got to speak to them, a number of the charities. You can see all the charity banners up there in the background, Water Wells for Africa up there. Do we got another one? Yeah, check it out. It's so cool. I was so happy to be able to go there and represent, you know, what we're doing there. Any more of those? 
Yeah, there we go. Come on. I wore my full-fledged borehole drilling jacket. <laughs> Got my check. And we're going to put this to good use right away. Look at him. He's blind. And he is planning to go to Biola. Can you imagine that? So I just thought you should know him. And if you're a praying person, you would want to pray for Justin. That he can see my banner in the background. What else traffic back there? Yeah, look at him. Sweetest guy. I prayed for him while we were there. Just to let you know. All the good things that are going on. I mean, God orchestrates things for us. God puts people in our path. God opens doors. God allows us to meet people and to be able to utilize resources that we can't even begin to imagine. So we want to not only pray for this, but the pray that God would continue to bring people and finances and resources into the work that he has for us. What do you say? All right. So, as you know, we have something here. The, this uh, road's completely cut in half and this. houses left submerged. Cyclone, Cyclone Freddy, Freddy has ripped Freddy. through Southern Africa for the second time in a month. Rescuers are now resorting to desperate measures to find victims trapped under the water and rubble. So far, we've recovered 30 bodies, but we're not yet done. We're still looking for victims. I'm using this hoe to find someone. So this is a flood relief camp that our friends, Isaac and Amos, are partnering with in order to bring resources and some assistance to this amazing situation over there so uh, the good thing about quick update from can we hold on that one just a second pastor kurt dolan has received word from hold our contacts that. in malawi maybe not there. all right wow that's the voice of morgan freeman or something so just to let you know this is the worst cyclone that they've in recorded history in the southern hemisphere it's the longest lived, the most powerful. It made landfall twice, came back, wrapped around again, came up and settled in the southern part of Malawi, which is where we have numerous four square churches and where we've been working for almost 30 years. We have lots and lots of friends there. And if you look at the track of the storm, it came up and settled right on top of Blantyre, which is this city right here. And we have, uh, that's where the main church is and the headquarters. And fortunately, the church is on top of a hill, which is good, but there's a huge ravine right there, and that water broke through the road, the main road that comes, that's, that takes the north to the south of the country. We haven't even got reports from the southern part, which is which is the lower shear, it's a plateau. So you have this drainage down to the low part, you got a rural river on one side and a shear river down the other, so it goes to Zambezi. So that whole area, is most likely completely underwater mm. and there will be a long-term effort to be some help there so we got a hold of all of our guys over there thank goodness for phones and cell phones right it's incredible what an age you live in but uh, people have lost their lives churches have been destroyed homes have been lost we want to help them okay we want to help them what do you say scripture says this he who closes his ears the cry of the poor will himself cry out and not be heard. We want to have the ears of Jesus. We want to give to make this happen. So because there's already a cholera outbreak in Malawi that is siphoning off resources and medical personnel, these camps don't have a lot of help. But our people have already been there, Project Heart to Heart, Isaac, Amos, and some of the people that we work with when we go every year. So the president of Malawi visited one of these flood camps, met our people and personally thanked them because of how stretched they are in terms of all the other needs that are going on. So it's kind of cool, isn't it? So we want to help them out. <clears throat> so if you want to participate that, which I'm hoping that you do, we have tied envelopes here, you just Put a, you know, if there's an Africa slot, it will go there, 100%. I'm going to wire some money off as soon as we get this taken care of. 
<clears throat> I personally am going to put in a thousand dollars, and that's not bragging to you, saying your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. But I am telling you that it's like a week's wages for me, because I believe that what we're doing is going to help impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to make life better for people and it's investing in the kingdom of god do you hear what i'm saying so if you give a dollar fifty cents whatever you can 100 percent of that is going to go to malawi relief so now we have this do we have this other video this is on our website you can steer people to it we damien did a great job here water church pastor kurt dolan has received word from our contacts in malawi and there are a number of homes and churches that have been destroyed our friends in malawi also work with you see that agencies building in the background first that DAPP. if you want That's to where send relief in the form of a check <laughs> you may address it to the post office box of the church which is in manhattan beach california that address is breakwater church p.o box 2410 manhattan beach california 90267 this is a developing situation if you want to send assistance you may send a check to breakwater church p.o box 2410 manhattan beach california 90267 in the memo write malawi relief Hey, Matt. How you doing? Yes, it is. Yes. Didn't they come by already? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that shouldn't happen. Good. No, 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 no problem. I so so you say it's still there. Okay, yeah, we'll come get that. We'll be right over. Appreciate the call. All right, bye bye. Trader Joe's had to take that call. One of the things we do is distribute $25,000 worth of food from Trader Joe's. And uh, they had a little mix-up today. Did you see my truck out there? See what's going Huh? Oh, okay. That's what it is. We have two different places we pick up from today. <laughs> All right. So we may have to have an emergency pickup over here at the one down at the corner. All right, ladies and gentlemen, where were we? Yes, we're helping out. God bless you, all right? Be sure and participate in this. This will be a long-term situation. They had another one of these in 2015 in January. The whole southern part of the country was devastated. When we went in June, we were able to take five tons of grain and corn down there to help people because the need's going to go on forever. Humanitarian aid is sometimes short-lived, but, you know, we have a heart for the country, and we want to continue to bless them uh, for long-term, okay? All right, let's continue to worship God, and thank you, for Bob, for being here. We want to be salt and light, don't we? Mm -hmm. All right. Can I get some guitar?